So I want to say first that I'm really honored to be here today. Um, as probably is true of many of you, um, reading Ted's work is what got me into this field to begin with. And everything I've done since has been influenced by your ideas. So thank you, Ted. Um, and I also want to say something that's probably obvious to most of us, which is that many of the key issues identified in computer lib dream machines are still with us today. And I want to sort of take the anniversary as an opportunity to look at three statements. Um, one, uh, probably many of you remember, you can and must understand computers now. Another, perhaps less well known, is presentation by computer is a branch of showbiz and writing, not psychology, engineering, or pedagogy. And then probably least well known, all simulation is political. And I think by taking a tour through these three and looking at sort of where we are, um, we can learn some things. So one, um, in case you didn't know where it came from, right? It's right up there at the top of the cover. Um, and I'd say, as a number of us have already discussed, this is at least as important today, right? So for example, consider massive government surveillance as revealed by Edward Snowden and others, right? Without a deep understanding of computers, you might ask yourself, is this morally right? Or is this a situation that we might car call Orwellian or headed towards a 1984 style future. With a deeper understanding of computers, you might ask yourself the same question, but you might also think of something else from the 1980s, right? The Star Wars initiative, the, the non-fictional 1980s. Um, and then you might realize that massive government surveillance, the dream of total information awareness, is as totally technically unworkable as the Star Wars Strategic Defense Initiative was, right? This is part of why understanding computers now is important to being a citizen, not just to being a technology worker. Um, so I'd say since Ted you know, started out bringing our attention to um, the need for general understanding of computing, um, a number of things have happened, and actually a couple of things we might even mention from before. So one, um, the earliest example I was able to find was uh, Alan Perlis arguing that all uh, first year students in universities should take a programming course, right? This was in 1961. Um, and of course, you know, everyone in this room is probably familiar with Logo. This was one of the first two languages I programmed in, right? So a programming language for learning, we talk about it now a lot uh, in terms of turtle graphics, right? First as a robot, then as an, a representation on screen. Um, and also there are much more recent things, like a number of you are probably familiar with Jeanette Wing calling for um, broad-based computational thinking in the population, right? So this was an argument that, you know, we have tools for solving problems, designing systems, and understanding human behavior that should be widespread, right? And I think this was at the time that Wing was at the NSF. She's now at Microsoft Research before at Carnegie Mellon, right? Of, of somebody who had a really good platform for spreading these ideas. But I think we need to ask ourselves, what are the real goals behind these systems and ideas, right? So um, let's see if my sound is on. Uh, my sound is not on. How do I get sound out? Um, and I apologize, apologize for this uh, technical gaffe. Is it main volume is muted? Is that the problem here? OK, let's give it a try. Oh, well, now we have lots of volume. OK. Um, so here's just a brief clip of Seymour Papert. It's true that most people in math class don't learn much math. Most kids in French class don't learn much French. But we don't say that they're not Frenchly minded. We don't say they don't have a head for French. Because we know that they grew up in France, they learned French perfectly well. And I think that my image of learning mathematics is if we all learned mathematics in Mathland, we would all learn mathematics perfectly well. And how can we create a Mathland? That's really what it's about. So probably this is familiar to many of you, right? But Logo is really about seeing the world mathematically, right? That's what's at the root of that project. And similarly, this is a report from the Royal Society, right? If you look at what computational thinking is really about, it's basically about thinking like a computer scientist, right? Um, now, these are fine and noble goals, but I'd say they fail to grasp the lessons of dream machines, right? And dream machines starts out 
with saying why Dream Machines is actually connected to Computer Lib, right? It's connected to Computer Lib because understanding computers is important to understanding the future of media. And this is where we find my second statement that I want to draw attention to, right? Presentation by computer is a branch of showbiz and writing, not psychology, engineering, or pedagogy, right? So we all, we must all understand computers, not just because computers are important, but because the media of the future or the then future, the now present and our future are computational. And one thing about thinking mathematically and thinking like a computer scientist that probably has occurred to all of you is that computer scientists are really lousy at thinking about media, right? I'm in a computer science department, um, I can say such things. Um, and so part of what we find ourselves here is in a bind, right? If all of our effort on understanding computers is focused on understanding them mathematically or in the terms of formal computer science, we're actually not making progress on what Ted identified as a key problem. Now, obviously, there's a tradition of exceptions, right? We're honored to have on the program today Alan Kay. And the Small Talk project was one of the first to really try, in a computational form, to think about this as a problem of reading and writing, to think about it as a problem of literacy, to think about it as a problem of making media, to think about it as a problem as of media making tools, and for those forms of media to include simulations. And there are a lot of things that have followed in this tradition since, right? So obviously processing is worth mentioning, right? It's a programming language by and for visual artists and designers. Scratch is worth mentioning, right? It's programming for kids using this metaphor of snap together blocks, which definitely has some media capabilities. Making media is one of the motivations for learning to program. Um, probably a number of you have heard of Kodu, right? Kodu is the predecessor to Microsoft's forthcoming project Spark. This is game programming for youth, programming that you could actually do just using an Xbox controller. You didn't necessarily need a keyboard. Um, and has this sort of metaphor of robotic style sensors and actions. And then of course, in addition to systems, there are also ideas, right? So the book Changing Minds really tries to focus on issues of literacy. Um, so in some ways, we could really see this as progress. But I think we have to ask again, what are the worldviews embedded in these systems and ideas, right? If we look at the catalog copy for Changing Minds, we see that really the goal here, even though we're talking about literacy, is science education. Um, now, something different, I think, happens if we look at Microsoft's um, research's explanation of what Kodu is. Um, I'd say we actually start to get something a little broader and more promising, right? creativity, problem-solving, storytelling, as well as programming. Um, and then also, if you look at who they talk about having partnered with, they talk about things like having um, partnered with NCWIT, right? They've partnered with organizations that care about things like a broader representation in fields of technology, a broader group of the population, in the case of NCWIT and DigiGirls, particularly more women. Um, so I'd say this sounds promising. But I'd say we also don't want to forget this statement, right? And this is the statement, all simulation is political, right? Every simulation program and thus every simulation has a point of view. Just like a statement in words about the world, it is a model of how things are with its own implicit emphases and so on, right? This is, I think, very important not to forget in this particular context. So in the kinds of media created with Scratch and Kodu and Alice and Squeak and Agent Sheets and so on, simulation is a primary form of representation. The world is represented through rules and the interaction of those rules and our interaction with those rules over time. And to get back to Ted's point, in simulations, the politics are in the rules and the data. And I would argue in systems for creating simulations, they are in the available elements and in the process of creation. So I just want to briefly look at one example. What I want him to do is then shoot, and we'll have him shoot a missile. OK, so that's the process of introducing shooting into a Kodu game. Now here's introducing something else into a Kodu game. Kodu is going to. perform a say action and you can write what you like so I'll just say mm, apples okay so here are some observations 
So if we um, look at the very top level of available actions, shooting is one of them, so is combat, right? Um, if we look at the top level of sensors, being shot is one of the top level sensors. If we look at something like saying things, it's kind of down in a submenu. If we um, think about something like, say, characters having internal life or beliefs, there is no menu for that. Um, if we think about things like characters having relationships to each other, right, it's also completely absent. And if you think about who this is made for, right, this is made for middle schoolers, right? Um, would you say that's what middle schoolers care about, right? I'd say there, there's a little group that is not the group that's underrepresented in computing, that where being, shooting and being shot is the primary thing they care about. I'd say there's a much larger group that cares about these totally absent things. Um, so another way of putting that is that Kodu made shooting simulations easy and relationship simulations impossible, shaping what was said and who got to say it. Um, and to Microsoft's researchers' credit, we approached them, um, both a group of us at UC Santa Cruz and Jill Denner, an educational psychologist at ETR, and said, we want to try to address this problem, right? We think you have something really compelling. What if we took it in a different direction? So the alternative, from my point of view, would be to start by adding possibilities. So here's an example of Kodu characters listening to each other, saying things, responding by becoming better friends, and this one glowing when a higher level of friendship is achieved. Right? Um, here is the actual programming that we made possible in Kodu to do things like turning saying and thinking into part of the active simulation. So here you can actually listen for things. And then later you can use the things that you listen for to do things like think and think about things like um, friendship and change its value by incremental amounts. And later you can trigger things by those incremental things going over certain values, right? Um, this is not rocket science, but this is something that a middle schooler can do, right? Um, and then what we did is we actually talked to kids, right? Um, what we did was we talked with them about what mattered to them while we were in the process of doing this. We iterated the tool. Um, we did things like um, move shooting down to the level of other simulation actions so that it wasn't privileged the way it was in the original. And what resulted was a much wider variety of games about a much wider variety of topics from kids who really did care about a diversity of things. And I would say, you know, obviously, Kodu is far from alone in needing this kind of intervention. Um, and I'd say broadening the simulation is only the first step. Now, to speak really broadly, Current tools and ideas may engage with the arts and humanities. I think many of them do that. I think they may focus on media making or, and or computational literacy, right? They may get part of Ted's message. But I'd say they're divorced from critical thinking about their representations, from point of view, from politics. The third statement of Ted's, they do not consider. And we all know that being apolitical is another term for supporting the status quo, right? For reproducing the same shooting games, for reproducing the same point of view. And I'd say when we do that, we actually end up solving the wrong problem, right? Um, so here's the kind of chart that we've all seen about the needs for growth in computer specialists, right? And basically, there's an argument that what we should be doing is just filling a pipeline for the current tech industry, right? We should be finding a way to meet the needs of the status quo. And I would argue, actually, what we want to be doing is educating people who will disrupt business as usual, right? The kind of people who will invent the media of the future and do it in a way that supports the values that are key to the best parts of our society. Similarly, I want to argue that so much of our focus on understanding computers has been on what I would call the writing side of literacy. And we actually need to think about the reading side of literacy just as much. And I think there are some hopeful things happening in this direction. So for example, there's the idea of procedural literacy, which is really focused on this idea of critical literacy for computational media makers. There's this idea of procedural rhetoric that draws on the history of rhetoric for understanding and making processes. There's the software studies series at MIT Press, which is dedicated to critical interpretation of software. But one thing that I think is true of all of these, right? I'm speaking at a software studies event soon, is they tend to forget that Ted was there first, 
right? And if you just take a quick look through computer lib dream machines, you see a huge amount of critical interpretation of particular pieces of software that dates back to you know, the first edition and articles he published before then, right? That that's the missing piece of the reading in what I think is the critical literacy about computers we need now. Uh, in closing, I want to say if we educate everyone to think critically about and with computational media, we are also educating them to think critically about computing. And that is the way that we can and must understand computers now. Thank you. Are there any questions for Noah? Seeing no one jump up immediately, I'd ask you if you had a question for him, grab him at lunch. And uh, we are running a look. Go right ahead, Rob. Right. I guess I'd say, you know, uh, maybe this is just me projecting onto Ted, right? But the, the vision that I got out of reading his work was of um, work with computing being like what I did in creative writing class or in debate, right? It was really about expressing oneself through computational media and being, yes, being able to engage in disagreement as well as building on the ideas of others. And I think that's, I think that's what I have in the back of my mind when I say uncritically critical thinking. Um, but I, I didn't really um, try to ground out the term. <laughs>